You know what's bullshit? Security stickers on DVDs. What's the point? Is this going to prevent somebody from stealing DVDs from Amazon.com's warehouse? And is it really necessary to put them on all three sides? I hate taking these things off. We didn't have this problem with VHS. Like, really now, why do I have to do this? Whose brilliant idea was this? Is there something I'm missing? Like, is this supposed to be fun? Do most people enjoy this? I don't. And you know what's the worst part about it? This DVD's part of a box set, and every single DVD had those three stickers. Isn't it enough that they're all inside the box? No, it isn't enough. There's another fucking thing that goes over. What a waste. That's bullshit. You know what's bullshit? Pennies. Pennies are worthless. What can you buy with a penny? Nothing. So why do we even have pennies? Get rid of them. Nobody likes to carry pennies around. Why is there so many pennies lying on the street that don't even get picked up? Because nobody fucking wants them. They're like mosquitoes. Go away, you fucking pennies. Think about it. There's four quarters to a dollar, two nickels to a dime. And there's five fucking pennies to a nickel. It's pointless. Even if you save a bunch of pennies, you're not going to feel like counting them. I mean, think about it. Think about how much time store clerks waste counting pennies back to people. And how often when the change is just a penny, how often do you hear people say, keep the change? A lot, because people don't want a penny. Every price should end in a five or a zero. Pennies are bullshit. You know what's bullshit? Shoelaces. What's wrong with them? They're assholes. They always come untied at the most inconvenient moment, like when you're on an escalator or walking through a crowded city street. You can double knot them, triple knot them, quadruple knot them, fuck tuple knot them, whatever. They always find a way to untie themselves just to be dicks. Remember Velcro shoes? Those were awesome because you didn't have to put up with that shit. Wow. I remember the last time I wore a pair of those, I was in fourth grade. Kids on the school bus would make fun of me because they said I didn't know how to tie my shoes. Well, I knew damn well how to tie my shoes. It's just that I didn't fucking feel like having to tie them. Remember bow biters? We should bring those back too. Or better yet, remember the movie Back to the Future 2? The self-lacing Nike shoes? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. If the year 2015 comes and we still don't have those power laces, all I'm going to say is, that's bullshit. Bullshit. You know what's bullshit? All these movies about penguins. Why is there so many? Because people love them. Oh, look at the penguin. It's so cute. Don't you just love those little fuckers? Aren't they fucking funny? Look, I have nothing against penguins, but it's not like they're the single most amazing creatures in the world. Those would be pygmy marmosets. They are awesome, and the ultimate proof that God has an outrageous sense of humor in the comedy that's called nature. Now, why can't we see some movies about those? Because everybody wants the fucking penguins instead, and that's bullshit. What's bullshit? The post office has only one pen. The bank, on the other hand, has so many pens, they give them out for free. So if the bank can be so generous, why the hell is the post office so fucking cheap and only able to afford one single pen? It's even attached to the table by a string. God forbid if somebody steals their only pen, everybody has to wait in line to use it. There's always somebody writing a fucking novel with it, and when it's finally your turn, guess what? It's always out of ink. Now, this is what you need to do. Go to your bank, grab a few of their free pens, and when you go to the post office, leave them on the table and say, here, 
You need these because the bullshit man said so. That's bullshit. Bullshit. Public toilets that you have to pay to use. That's not fair. If I gotta go, it doesn't matter if I have a quarter. I still gotta go. It's not like it's a matter of choice, like it's admission to a fucking show. Then there's times when there's somebody standing in the bathroom handing you paper towels. Like, what the fuck? Whoever came up with the idea of taking money off you taking a shit is fucking bullshit. Now, let's face it. Unless you stay home, public toilets are mandatory because in humanity's growing effort to become civilized, proper facilities need to be present to release feces. But once we have to start paying for our own bodily functions, I say go back to the wild. They want to make a business out of us having to do our business? Man, fuck that. That business is between you and nature. I say go out on the grass and take a shit like that cow. But wait, that's not cow shit. That's bullshit. What's bullshit? Temperature. Yeah, temperature is bullshit. Why do we have to have it? Think about how often it controls your life. For example, food and beverages. There's stuff you gotta keep cold and stuff you gotta heat up. Isn't it a pain in the ass to use a microwave to reheat last night's dinner? You punch in some number and then you wait and then it's like, damn, it's still fucking cold. But there could still be a part in the same meal that's so hot it burns your fucking mouth. Especially potatoes. Potatoes are assholes. They're so unpredictable. Oh, and of course there's the weather. Don't even get me started. Right now, it's cold out. Yeah, it's fucking cold. But in a few months, it's going to be too hot. Yeah, and then it's going to be too cold again, and then too hot, too cold, too hot for the rest of our lives. You dress for the heat, you dress for the cold. It controls your damn life. Some animals can't even survive in the heat, and some can't survive in the cold. Well, how about just have one neutral temperature that satisfies every creature on Earth? Man, fuck the winter, fuck the summer, fuck being hot, fuck being cold, I don't like it. If I could talk to nature, I'd say, you know, I like what you've done, space, that's fine, time, that's fine, temperature, that's bullshit. Bullshit! Printers. Printers are man's inhumanity to man. I hate printers. They give you nothing but shit. All I want to do is print out an email, some map quest directions, or a Word document. Black text on a sheet of paper. That's all. But no, the color ink cartridge is low on ink. Who cares about the fucking color? I'm just trying to print black. I shut the fucker off and I turn it back on and it keeps printing this garbage. What is this? I didn't ask for this. Follow these steps? You mean you can't just show it on the screen? What a waste of paper! And besides, what a waste of ink, the thing that's in such jeopardy. The color ink is low? Bullshit! I see blue and I see red. Not to mention all I'm trying to do is print black. So you can't print black text, but you can print all this junk. Stop doing it! I don't want this! So I buy new ink, and guess what? It doesn't work. The numbers have to match. What's the difference between black 56 and black 21? Who the fuck cares? It's the same fucking cartridge, you picky bastard. Oh, and the paper jams. Cut me a break. That's bullshit. What's bullshit? That's bullshit. It's nearly the middle of January. Take down your fucking Christmas decorations. Bah, humbug. To me, Christmas happens in December, but it seems to start whenever it wants and end whenever it wants. I've seen Christmas stuff in the stores as early as October. At least wait until after Halloween. That's bullshit. Bullshit. And what about Thanksgiving? Nobody gives a flying fuck about that. What a glutton of a holiday. It just devours everything around it. 
and even after Christmas, you can still walk into a shopping mall and hear Christmas music playing. If you're gonna start it early, at least end it early, it's bullshit! Bullshit! Well, Merry Christmas. What's so merry about it? Or I can be PC and say Happy Holidays, but nowadays, people complain even more about that. Ooh, I don't want to have to ask everyone what they celebrate. Well, that's why if you're not sure, you say Happy Holidays. Ooh, I don't want to say that. I want to say Merry Christmas. Well, you can't please everybody, so we need a new PC term. I got it. How about Happy Shut the Fuck Up? Let's start saying that. Well, I think I'm gonna go celebrate St. Patrick's Day like two months early and just start getting wasted now. Cause Christmas is over. And that's bullshit. BULLSHIT! You know what's BULLSHIT? Hotel room TVs. You know why? There's no RCA inputs. I don't know about you, but I like to bring entertainment with me. A DVD player, a video game console. You know, wouldn't it be nice to hook that shit up to your TV? But you can't, because there's no input. Except for that coaxial shit on the back. So your only chance is to bring an RCA to coaxial adapter and move that big ass cabinet away from the wall. Actually, it would be really nice if the TV had a DVD player. Every television I've ever seen in my life at least has the RCA input on the front. Unless it's like 20 or 30 years old. So let me ask, where do you find a TV that doesn't have RCA? Go to Best Buy, go to Walmart, go to Circuit City, any electronics store, I guarantee you will not find one. So, is there some secret factory that sells specially made hotel room TVs just to inconvenience their guests? There must be, and you know why they do it? Because they got you by the balls. They offer both movies and video games, but you gotta pay for them. That's how they get you. Nobody wants to just watch the regular television. There's like 10 channels and they all suck. Half of them are 24-hour advertisements for the hotel resort or local restaurant or some bullshit. It's more entertaining to stare at the picture of the lighthouse on your wall. Got a laptop? Great, go on the internet. Oh, fuck, you gotta pay for that too, right? It's not like you're gonna use it all day. Most of the time, if you're on business or vacation, the only reason you're in your room is because either you're sleeping or there's nothing to do. It's not like I wanna pay just to have internet for two hours. So, fuck it, break out the deck of cards, cause that's bullshit. <laughs> BULLSHIT! DVDs. I already talked about the excessive packaging and security stickers, but there's so much more wrong with them. With any TV series or movie sequel sold together, they're guaranteed to fuck it up. The first issue is the packaging. It seems like a game. How many boxes can we fit the DVDs inside? Do we really need all this? And second, this is the James Bond series. Why couldn't it start with the first movie and work its way to the end? Was there any reason to rearrange them in any order they please? A regular consumer might not even be aware of the order. So here's what I do. Throw the boxes in the garbage and fix the DVDs in the right order. Now that's the way it should be. Besides, don't you like the convenience of grabbing a DVD off the shelf? When are you ever going to want to cover them up in boxes? Another thing that can be confusing about box sets is when not all the movies are owned by the same company. This is the Bruce Lee set. Would you believe there's no Enter the Dragon, but instead Game of Death 2? I mean, come on, he's not even in that movie except for stock footage. Even the DVD itself has the balls to claim it stars Bruce Lee. Everybody knows he never completed the first game of death. It's false advertising that persists to this very day. If you're buying a box set with intentions of owning all movies in that franchise, you need to have prior knowledge or do the research beforehand to know exactly what you're getting. Box sets are bullshit. Here's another thing I hate, those little snap things. What's the point? The DVD shuts fine just without those. Break them the fuck off. That would be like putting them on a CD jewel case or a book. You don't need them. I also hate how many versions of DVDs get released. We have the rated edition, unrated edition, special edition, ultimate edition, collector's edition. Knock it the hell off! 
But what pisses me off the most is when there's a full screen and a widescreen edition. Unless you pay attention, you might be suckered into buying the full screen. There's no reason the full screen should even exist, and if it should, make it the other side, not its own DVD. It's bullshit. Now you want to talk about region coding? So what if I buy a perfectly legal DVD in one part of the world and want to watch it somewhere else? What if I travel a lot? All these rules treat the customer like a fucking animal. Better keep your eye on those animals, put up an electric fence, give the dog a shock collar. They might be bad. Have you ever looked at all the tiny logos found on a DVD? Most of it's pretty useless information. But where's the runtime? That's what I'd like to know. It's not on the disc, not on the box, not on the individual DVD case, and not in the booklet. Gee, runtime? Why would I ever want to know that? How about if I have an appointment, or there's a show coming on, or I'm just planning to go to bed soon? I don't know. Is it such a taboo thing for me to know how long the movie is before I watch it? Most DVDs seem to have them, but they're in such tiny print, they're so hard to find, and they're always in minutes. Just a minor complaint, but look, 153 minutes. Why can't it just say 2 hours, 33 minutes? That's like if I say I'll see you in a week. I don't say I'll see you in 168 hours. The worst I've seen, sometimes if there's more than one movie, they just add the total runtime of all the movies. 325 minutes. That's beautiful. Maybe that'll come in handy if I'm planning to have a marathon. But the most inconvenient thing about DVDs is the menus. All I want to do is pop in the DVD, hit play, and watch the movie. But instead, you get all kinds of shit you don't want to watch. Trailers, logos, that would be fine if you could skip it. But no, you have to watch this bullshit every time you start the DVD. You find yourself pressing the menu button just hoping in vain that the menu appears. But it doesn't, and sometimes even worse, if you hit the menu button, it starts the logo all over again. That'll teach you. Sometimes they even put ads in the beginning. That's just a step away from having ads on your TV. And I'm not talking about regular commercials. I mean, in addition to that, every time you turn on your TV, it plays 10 minutes of ads before it starts. Or how about even better? Let's put TV screens in elevators. Before the elevator can move, you have to watch some ads. We got them there. And if the DVD is a TV series, just please have a list of the episodes. Here, you go to pick an episode, wait for the animation, and then what is this? Every episode has their own screen with chapter selections. Who cares about chapters for a 20 minute TV show? So you have to go through all the screens, find the episode, move back up to the first chapter, and hit play. With DVDs, I don't care about any of this shit. I don't want to wait for logos and trailers. I don't even want to see clips of the movie I'm about to watch before the menu appears. Just put in the DVD, take me to the menu, that's it. With VHS, you had to rewind, sure, but at least there was nothing prohibiting you from fast-forwarding to the movie. And that's another thing I miss. You get that fuzzy line at the top, but isn't it better than that stuttering digital fast-forward we're so used to today? You get that awesome telephone dial sound in the beginning of the tape. Okay, that's just weird, but the best part, no matter where you stop, you can always start the movie exactly where you left off. And DVDs fuck up way more than VHS. With analog tape, it deteriorates gradually. Worst scenario, it may get caught up in your VCR, but DVDs, once they start skipping, they're never the same. No. It's like we're going forward in technology, but only making our lives bullshittier. And when the bullshit man says that's bullshit, that's bullshit. You know what's bullshit? A little while ago, I saw a trailer for a movie called The Final Destination, and I was thinking, wow, they must be really out of ideas to do a remake of Final Destination already. But no, apparently it's just another film in the same series. Well, how do they get off calling it by the same title? A movie should not be called the same thing unless it's a remake or otherwise unrelated. 
Oh, wait, sorry. Let me correct myself. The Final Destination. Years from now, who the hell's going to know the difference? If you're looking for it on DVD, it's going to be like, which one? Final Destination or The Final Destination? Which one's the first? I already forget. They did the same thing with the Fast and the Furious. The fourth one is just called Fast and Furious. It's almost like they're trying to disguise the fact that it's a sequel. Like nobody wants to see sequels. The whole fucking industry is built off of sequels and remakes and TV show adaptations. By making a sequel, they're obviously trying to capitalize on the success of the earlier movies. So why not tell people this is four? At least they should have called it the Fast and the Furious. It would have been stupid, but it would have been no more gimmicky than Too Fast, Too Furious. If they're going to make the titles so similar, they might as well just call it the same exact thing. Because what's the point? By taking out the word the, it really helps distinguish it from the first movie? If they wanted to distinguish it from the first movie, they would just call it The Fast and the Furious 4. And if it's a Stallone movie, it's fucked. Rocky Balboa, Rambo, what next? A sequel to Cliffhanger called Cliffhanger? What is the problem with movie titles nowadays? Could they possibly be any more confusing? Are they out of their fucking minds? I'm the bullshit man, and I say, that's bullshit. You know what's bullshit? Places that sell bagels with butter or cream cheese because they put too much fucking cream cheese on it. Mostly, this problem I've encountered happens at Dunkin' Donuts and Wawa. And for those of you from around the world, yes, that's what it's called, Wawa. But is there any need to put this much cream cheese on a bagel? I have to get a plastic spoon or a napkin to wipe it off. You can't bite into it without getting it all over your face. Seriously, who wants all that? When the cream cheese fills the hole in the middle of the bagel, I think that's when you should realize it's too much. So are you going to eat the cheese in the middle of the hole? Or are you going to get a spoon and push it out? Like shit being squished out of a seagull's asshole. I mean, who's going to eat that? You might as well just be eating a plain glob of cream cheese. Now, maybe that's what some people like. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody came in and complained that there wasn't enough cream cheese. So now they just cover the fucking things. Now, that's fine with me. If somebody else likes it, that's okay. But why not have options for different amounts of cream cheese? There should be markings on the wrapping paper that says light, medium, or extra. But I never saw anything like that, and that's bullshit. Wait, I'm not done. Let me take one moment to talk about something. Though you've never seen my face, you know me as the bullshit man. I speak from the heart and I tell you everything that's on my mind. But I'm tired of holding back my true identity. It's kind of embarrassing, but being a man who addresses bullshit, I think it's appropriate you know what I look like. And if you wonder why I'd keep my face a secret for so long, now you'll know why. Because my face is bullshit. You know what's bullshit? Packaging. You rip open a package and it takes a shit all over your hands. What is this shit? It gets all over the place and it flies in the air. <coughs> oh God. It sticks to my fucking clothes, too. Who invented this? Who thought it would be a good idea to have a package that you can't open without having a vacuum cleaner ready? Why is this so common? In fact, film festivals hate this. Every application I've ever seen says, please do not submit films in fiber-filled envelopes. Because nobody wants this garbage. So then why do we use it? Fiber-filled envelopes need to be abolished. Another thing I hate is packing peanuts. Isn't that fun? You open a box only to have it explode into a hailstorm of styrofoam. It sticks to everything. I feel like I'm being attacked. I try to be careful and not let much of it spill outside the box, but it's impossible when you have to dig in there just to get your stuff. All for that, packing peanuts belong to the fucking dark side. There's no good reason to use them. They're not environmentally friendly, and if you have cats or dogs, you gotta hurry and clean it up before they eat it and choke. As a human race, 
we really failed when it comes to mailing things. Let's use newspaper and bubble wrap. That doesn't make a mess, and you can use it over and over again. Fiber-filled envelopes and packing peanuts come from the depths of hell. Take it from a man whose face is made of bullshit. That's bullshit! Alright man, I'm going to tell you why DVDs fail, I'm going to tell you why DVDs succeed, alright? We're talking Blu-rays too, because Blu-rays are getting worse. I just want to talk about some of the stupid packaging that comes with DVDs. I mean, first of all, why do they always have to have this thing? You know, we don't need that. And then, that's not enough. Then you got to get the, the rest out. Ugh. And it's like, always gets stuck. So, okay, that's another fucking piece. Alright, get that out of here. And then, then what is this? It's got like, like paper things always falling out and everything. So, okay, where are the DVDs? Where are the Blu-rays? Oh, here they are. Look at this. And then it still has this stupid thing you got to open up. Like, ah, oh, like, come on. So, all right, that's that. Then we got Back to the Future on Blu-ray. Check this out. First, you got to, all right, that doesn't do anything. Oh, I see. It's another one of these. So throw that away. Like, what, what are we going to be worried that it's going to scratch up the front cover? I don't care. Um, look at this. Like, there's no, like, <laughs> there's nothing holding the DVD. It's like, you think it would just slip out, but it doesn't. I try pulling this way, nothing happens. I try pulling up on it, and then I feel like I'm going to, like, break the DVD if I pull too hard. There's these little, like, thingamajigs down here, which you got to, you know... I, I don't even know how this comes out. And then, oh, crap, look. Look at this. There are instructions. There's fucking instructions how to take a DVD out. Blu-ray. A Blu-ray, whatever the fuck it is. <laughs> so, look at this. All right, so anyway, that's that. Now, this is a good one, pretty much. You just open it up, and there you go. Sometimes these things in the middle, they're always different. Some of them you got to push harder on than others. I like these kind. They just have like the two little pieces here. You push down, DVD pops out, you know. Um, this one here, this one's pretty easy. No trouble there. And obviously you don't want it to fall out too easy because you don't want the DVD to like, you know, get scratched during shipping or anything. Um, but this is good, you know, it just snaps shut. That's what I say, gorgeous. This is gorgeous, that's the way you want it. This one, this one's still pretty easy, but they're all different. And then this one here, oh, it's not opening. Oh, look at this. You gotta open up these little stupid fucking latches. Like, what's the point? Like. Like, right now, the DVD doesn't snap shut. Like, I need these things to, like, hold it. No, I don't. I don't need these. Like, like look, like, right now, it's going to be like, oh, oh, shit, the DVD won't stay shut. Whoops. 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 No. You just do that, it snaps shut. You don't need these things. Fucking assholes. You know what's bullshit? Those spike things in parking lots. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. It's when a public parking space doesn't want vehicles passing in one direction for whatever reason. So the most sensible solution they could come up with is to put these spike things on the road. If you drive over them in the wrong direction, it fucks up your tires. Nice invention. Think you went a little overboard there? It's like setting a mouse trap that treats the common driver like a fucking house pest. I can imagine sitting there in my car with deflated tires. It's sorry, I went the wrong way. Does the punishment fit the crime? Couldn't there just be a sign or a one-way barrier of some kind? Is it really a better idea to have cars stuck there with their tires ruined, having to wait for a tow truck to come and haul them away? What if the tires deflate slow enough so that the vehicle can get out onto the highway and then get into a fucking accident? Better to risk people's lives and property than to have someone going the wrong way in your parking lot. There actually exist plenty of websites that sell this shit. This one here flat out says, 
They are designed to puncture the tires of offending vehicles. That sounds like a prank. If that's accepted and legal, then why stop there? How about a giant bucket that pours glue onto the car and then fans that blow feathers all over it? How about springs that flip the car onto its top? How about Ewoks cutting down swinging logs that smash your windows, fatally wounding both the passenger and driver? And then the gremlins come and puncture the gas tank. Manic deranged werebears take their flamethrowers to it and the whole fucking car explodes! That'll do it. That'll keep people out of your precious parking lot. Fucking assholes. That's not just bullshit. That's fucking bullshit. You know what's bullshit? iTunes. I listen to music just about every day. I'm always using iTunes. I've been helplessly dependent on this software for the past 10 years now. It's truly my digital jukebox, and I can't imagine my life without it anymore. But I do have to say, it's pretty annoying every time you buy a new computer, you have to authorize it to play all the music that you purchased on the old computer from the iTunes store. It wouldn't be so bad, except there's a limit to how many computers you can authorize. That would never happen with CDs. Have you ever had a CD player tell you, sorry, but you own too many CD players. You're gonna have to deauthorize one of them or else you can't play the CD. So next thing, I'm going up in the fucking attic to find my old computer so I can plug it in and deauthorize it. But now, let's get to the main point about iTunes. It's an evolving beast always pestering you with updates. Way too often, I open iTunes to find a message that says, there's a new version of iTunes, do you want to download the update? I say, sure, that sounds good, I'd like to update. Then I find something is different, something I don't like. For example, remember when there used to be a button to burn CDs? It was a nice little round, flashy button, convenient and easy to get to. For years now, that button's been gone. Now, you have to go to the file menu and burn playlists to disk. There isn't even a short key for it. You have to go to the menu. I understand that not many people are burning CDs nowadays, but what made Apple decide that it was so obsolete they had to get rid of the button? It's changes like this that piss me off. If it's not broken, don't fix it. So I've caught on to you, you stupid updates. I'm not downloading you anymore. I'm sticking with the old version. But then the message comes back. Oh yeah, it comes back to haunt you. You have no choice. One of these days, you're going to download it by accident. Even if you click that little checkbox to stop reminding you, all that means is that, say, it's asking you to download version 10.2.7, it'll stop asking you again for that particular version, but a week later when version 10.2.8 is out, it's going to start asking you again. Eventually, when you're suckered into updating, there's going to be all this new shit. Genius playlists? Nice. Now i got to wait for iTunes to scan all my music so that I can create playlists based on songs that other users have that are similar to mine, whatever. You know what would be genius? To go back to the way it was! Now there's ping? What the hell's that? Every time they add something, it seems like it takes longer to boot up. Back in the day, I'd click iTunes, it would open. Now, it bounces a few times, shows me a beach ball, and when it finally starts, it tells me it's searching for genius results, accessing the iTunes store, updating playlist information, contacting Mars, raising shields, activating atomic sound wave booster, scanning for nuclear barracudas. How about just let me play my music and let that be it? You can flip through the album artwork now, all these unnecessary things, just to look more impressive to the common dummy who sits there and goes, Wow, that looks cool. I want to buy that. iTunes is turning into a monster. We all keep feeding it, and it's been growing ever since. One day, all the albums are going to be hologram, flying all over the place. You're going to be able to listen to ten songs at the same time. How did we get so far away from just dropping a needle on a record and letting it play? Cassettes, CDs, remember when CDs first came out, it was like, damn, you don't have to rewind them, you can skip songs, you can put it on repeat or shuffle, and then one day somebody looked at their CD and their computer and decided the two must come together. Like a caveman putting a stick to a fire, the computerized music format was born, and the digital devil's been pulling us deeper in ever since. I'll tell that devil to fuck off, stop updating iTunes, and say, that's bullshit.
You know what's bullshit? Feeding birds. I have a bird feeder in my backyard. I don't know why it's there. Every now and then, I put bird seed in it, and the next day, it's all gone. <laughs> why do I bother? I could have gone weeks without filling the damn thing, and the birds always manage to come back. So they're obviously not starving to death. Why do I feed them? They don't feed me. I could tell you that for damn sure. Yeah, I'll let you know the day a cardinal flies in and brings me a fucking sandwich. Birds do nothing for me. They come, eat the food, and leave shit all over my patio. These bastards are spoiled, too. I could just throw the bird seed out into the yard, but they get it all in this nice little feeder that hangs up in a tree where they like it. How about the hummingbird? The hummingbird is like the rich snob who only dines at the finest restaurants. This asshole won't settle for the plain ordinary bird seed. Oh, no. Instead, a specially made concoction of sugar and water. And if that's not enough, it has to be inside a very specific container. Want me to come pull out a chair for you fucking birds? Put the napkin in your lap for you? Bring out some of my best wine so you can taste them and spit them in my fucking face? Only reason I feed the birds is because the cats like watching them. Yeah, they're entertaining, aren't they? Well, some bird species on this planet have very amusing names. Supposedly, there's a bird called a red-footed booby. Yeah, I don't believe it either. There's also dick sizzle, turtus, and all these tit names like brown tit babbler, pendulum tits, agile tit tyrant, and great tit. <laughs> oh, that can't be real. That's bullshit. You know what's bullshit? Wire hangers. I don't need the best hangers to hang my clothing. I don't care about those fancy, fluffy ones or those big-ass ones for hanging suits. All I need is something sturdy and reliable. But when I run out of all my good hangers, I end up having to resort to hanging some of my shirts on these cheap wire hangers. I don't even know why I have so many of these. They're useless. The shirts keep falling off because the wires keep bending. Even when I try to bend them up, they still fall off. Get on there, you son of a bitch. Ugh! Fuck! Ah, you can't support the weight of that heavy shirt. Oh, and don't ever try hanging pants on them. You'd have better luck with those stupid clip things that only work when they're in the store. The only reason to use wire hangers is for your Captain Hook costume. Wire hangers are such pieces of shit, even Michael Myers hates them. I kind of like that hanger from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Although, the scene that sums up wire hangers perfectly is the scene from Mommy Dearest. What's wire hangers doing in this closet when I told you no wire hangers ever? Wire hangers suck. They might work at first, but then a week later you find your clothes on the floor. That's when it's time to use the drawers, because that's bullshit. That's bullshit! Microwaves. Why do they beep all the time? Every time I push a button, beep beep! What's the point? Just to let me know I'm hitting the buttons? I can see on the digital screen what I'm pressing. I don't need a loud, obnoxious beep to let me know. I know this may seem like a minor complaint, but it's really starting to get on my nerves. My whole life, every microwave I've ever owned goes beep beep, beep beep! Microwaves are the noisiest kitchen appliance I own, besides a blender, and a blender has every reason to be loud. I'm not trying to wake anybody up. You know what I'm talking about. You might be living with roommates, it might be your parents. Whoever's in the house is gonna hear beep beep, beep beep. I just want a little something to eat. I don't want the whole house to know what I'm doing. And then, when the timer's done, what does it do? Beep beep, just to let you know the food's done. As if I didn't remember, two minutes ago, I put food in the microwave. Maybe that'll be helpful when I'm 98 years old and I can't even remember if I took a shit that day. They should start selling beeping microwaves as an option. They could call them microwaves for old fucks. Why does it have to beep? Obviously, I'm just standing there waiting. It's 3 in the morning. I'm not going anywhere. Sometimes I wait till the timer gets to one second and I hit cancel just so I don't have to hear that shit. But you eventually have to reset the timer anyway, which makes it beep some more. Even if you look at it funny, it beeps. 
I give it the finger, it beeps. As if it's always cursing at me, the asshole. And don't go anywhere, don't set the timer for two minutes and think you can go do something else, because if you're not back in two minutes, it'll beep. Ten seconds later, it'll beep again. And again, and again, just to remind you. And does it matter anyway? Does my food become warm at exactly two minutes? I don't know, it's mashed potatoes. I guess maybe two minutes, 30 seconds? It's just a guessing game. Who knows the exact time? Unless you're a fucking microwaveologist. If you are, maybe you can explain. What the fuck is a microwave anyway? And should I get a regular size wave? You tell me, it's a fucking box that makes stuff hot. How does that happen? Why does it make the food warm, but if I leave a metal fork in there, there's sparks and flames? What kind of sorcery is this thing? Takes three minutes to heat up a bowl of soup, but sets the foil wrap on my meatball sub in flames in a matter of seconds? Somebody invented it. It's called a microwave oven, and it's bullshit. You know what's bullshit? Assholes. No, literally. My asshole. My dick, too. Why? Because they piss the shit out of me. Especially in the morning. Watch this. Alright, which one of you bastards wants to go first? Well, you're not giving me much of a choice there. Must have been some good dreams. Wish I could remember them. Come on, shit, you asshole. Hey, who's the asshole, pal? You're the asshole, you asshole. It takes one to know one, fuckface. Just hurry up and shit, you dumbass, jerkhead, motherfucker. I know you are, but what am I? An asshole, that's what you are. I am a hole in your ass. Come on, I gotta take a shower. I ain't stopping you, cock mongrel. Oh, no, not now! Are you shitting me? Yeah, I'm shitting you, dick brain. Why now? You wait till I take a shower to take a shit? You can take the shit, pal. I'm the one leaving it. Stop being an asshole! You can't change what I am, goat fucker. What are you then? A hole in your ass. Which is? An asshole. Well, we agree on that. I'm much better looking than you, shit face. Stop it, I hate when you call me shit face. Well, what's that on your face? Shit, okay? I have a face full of shit. <laughs> shit face. Fuck you, I used to look normal before all this bullshit happened to me. How sad. I'm the one who has to regurgitate bullshit from your stupid ass. Oh no, that's not bullshit. That's bullshit. What's bullshit? The GPS in my car. But the thing is, I need it. I'm not good at navigating. Back in the day when you'd have to print out directions on the internet, it was a pain in the ass. So then the GPS comes along and makes life easier. Well, almost. Sometimes it takes too long to get a signal. If the GPS doesn't know where I am, how the hell do I? Come on, are there space gremlins hanging on the satellites? So then, I'm driving around, and it sends me on the most back-ass roads possible. How did I get here? I didn't set it to avoid major highways or anything. It'll take you through someone's driveway, wherever it takes to get from point A to point B. If you're on a bridge, it expects you to turn off a road that's underneath the bridge. Really? You want me to crash through the guardrail and kill myself? So, I keep going, and it keeps saying, recalculating. Recalculating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Recalculating. Shut up. Recalculating. It takes like nine hours, and when it finally works, it tells me to turn on the road that's like ten feet in front of me. Recalculating. Of course it's too late. That's like split-second reaction time. So, I pass the road, and what does it do? Recalculating. Recalculates again to another road without any advance notice. Recalculate. We could do this all day. Recalculate. Fuck you. Don't kill yourself. And I hate it when it falls off the window. 
The worst is those weight things that sit on the dashboard. I just don't like the idea. What if I get into an accident? I don't want this thing flying at me and smashing my fucking skull. Oh well, I can't go back to not using a GPS. I'm dependent on the damn things. But they're like creepy, artificial life forms that are in control of your destiny and could kill you if you were dumb enough to do exactly what they said. That thing on the windshield is bullshit. You know what's bullshit? Warranties. You go to the store, you buy something, say a shitty pair of speakers for your computer, the cashier asks you if you want to buy a warranty with it. That should cover it against malfunction or defects or whatnot. You say, no. What's the point anyway? If you take out the box and there's something wrong with it, you can usually return it anyway. A warranty typically covers anything that may happen to it years from now. But if you drop it or damage it somehow accidentally, it won't cover that. No, only if it miraculously self-destructs on its own. And by the time it dies naturally, the warranty will be expired. One time I bought a video projector. The sales guy told me that the bulbs are really expensive and they cost hundreds of dollars to replace. So he sold me a warranty. He said that in case the bulb would burn out within three years, this warranty would entitle me to a replacement. Sounded like a good plan. Well, just less than three years ago, the bulb burns out. So I take it back to the store with the warranty. None of the same people are working there anymore. They have no idea what I'm talking about. I show them the warranty, the salespeople look at it, the cashiers look at it, the manager comes out and looks at it, nobody has a fucking clue. I tell them it's supposed to cover the bulb. If the bulb burns out, I get a new one. The manager thinks it over, scratches his head, and comes to the conclusion that the warranty only covers manufacturer defect, anything but the bulb, and that the warranty may have been different three years ago when I bought it. Three years ago, I bought a piece of paper. They sold me a piece of paper that would have gone to better use if I wiped my ass with it. My receipt did no good either. It was now just a reminder to the money I wasted. And that's bullshit. What's bullshit? Amplifiers that don't go to 11. Come on, why do most amplifiers still go to 10? What do I do when I need that extra boost? It's been almost 30 years since Marty DeBerge's groundbreaking documentary about the most influential rock band of all time, Spinal Tap. They invented the 11 amp, and you'd think by now everybody would be using it. Does that mean it's louder? Is it any louder? Well, it's one louder, isn't it? That band is so prolific. They were the first band to do an all-black album cover. Where do you think Metallica got the idea from? Well, ACDC came first, but that had words on it. It wasn't really all black. Spinal Tap was the band that made Stonehenge famous. Nobody would have ever known about Stonehenge had it not been for the song. Stonehenge, where the demons dwell. Well, maybe some people knew about Stonehenge. Anyway, the amplifier that goes to 11 is ingenious. It's the best idea ever. With all other amplifiers, you go up to 10 and that's it. You've hit the roof. There's nowhere to go after that. There's nowhere to go after, yeah, I, I don't know where to go now. Everything I just said, that's bullshit. Grass, not just any grass. Grass planted in high-level nutrient soil in a pasture or native rangeland with sufficient sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water to produce photosynthetic tissue for the production of carbohydrates. Fertilizer is applied early in the spring growth season. The C3 species of grass develop when temperatures are between 40 and 75 degrees and generate leaves that grow into tube-like rolls at their base and unfurl as they extend. The growth habits are nutritious forage to the livestock. A non-castrated adult male, the cattle species, comes by and eats the grass. The vegetative pillars are passed through the esophagus and ingested into the cattle's stomach, which consists of four compartments. The rumen breaks down the food with the aid of bacteria. The partly digested food is passed onto the reticulum, where foreign materials are filtered out. The food passes through the omasum and then the abomasum, where it is fully digested with HCI acid. Then it goes into the small and large intestines, where it becomes shit. 
The fecal matter causes the rectal walls to expand, triggering the contractions of the rectal muscles and relaxation of the anal sphincter. The crap is forced out of the rectum into the anal canal, where the muscles create wave-like movements that push the contents of the canal forward. Finally, the anus contracts itself over the exiting feces, emptying the grass-turned turds out of the male cattle's asshole onto the ground. You know what that is? That's bullshit! Vampires. Don't get me wrong, vampires were an awesome concept, an unholy creature of the night that's dead but remains alive by feeding on the blood of the living. With an unstoppable immortal villain like that, they need to have a weakness, an Achilles heel if you will. But with all the stories over the generations, there's been too many ways to kill a vampire, or keep them from killing you. Of course there's the classic wooden stake, you drive it through their heart, they die. Then there's Silver. I guess the werewolf curse rubbed off. Silver's not as common with the vampire myth, but supposedly it still does the job. Whether a silver bullet or anything made of silver. So if you can stab him with something silver and something made of wood, then it could probably be made of anything. I don't know, has anyone ever tested anything else? You can also kill a vampire by severing their head. Now, I don't know anybody that would survive if their head was cut off. I guess anything that would normally kill a person would also kill a vampire. In fact, in the Dracula novel, the famous Count is killed by knives. Fire, that's another one. If a vampire's trapped in a fire and burns to ashes, that's game over. Sunlight, that's classic. A vampire is as vulnerable as undeveloped film. Expose them to sunlight, they're useless. Then there's all the religious things. For example, a vampire scared away if you show them a crucifix. Or anything that's shaped like a cross. So it can even happen by accident. Holy water. Just because water's been blessed by a priest, they can't touch it. It burns them. By the way, who cares about holy water when you can also kill them with regular, plain-ass water? That's right, running water to be exact. So if they fall in a river or try to take a shower or something, they're done for. A Bible, they can't touch that either. The hawthorn tree can also hurt a vampire because of its connection with the crown of thorns on Jesus Christ. So that's the religious stuff. Of course a vampire is an unholy being so he's fended off by holy things. That makes sense at least. But where did the whole garlic thing come from? If you put garlic around your house, consider yourself safe. Vampires won't go near it. I don't like asparagus, but you put asparagus in the room, I'm not gonna run away. Wolfbane, another thing that should be reserved for the werewolf. That's what Wolfbane means, it's a werewolf repellent. But no, it keeps vampires away too. Mirrors, they don't cast a reflection. That's fine if you want to recognize them, but sometimes they hate mirrors so much, it's another way to keep them out. Rice or seeds, this one is just fucking stupid. Supposedly, if you spread rice or seeds around, they'll have to stop and count them all. So every vampire's like the Count from Sesame Street? How dysfunctional can any terror of the night be to have to count things? Also, they have to sleep in their own native soil. That comes from the myth about them having to return to their own grave at night. So they can't travel far unless they have their coffin with them, filled with dirt. That's great. Wanna load up your house with garlic, crucifixes, and wolfbane to keep out vampires? Not necessary. Just don't invite them in. That's right, a vampire can't enter your home unless you invite them! Is this supposed to be a blood-sucking horror or a cock-sucking pussy? If vampires were real, I wouldn't even be scared. I'd feel sorry for them. They can't go out in the day, they have to drink blood, they're killed by water and sunlight, two things that are as common as common could be, and they have to sleep in a coffin filled with dirt. Might as well be filled with bullshit! <laughs> If you stay in a lot of hotels, you come across some weird things, contraptions that defy human intelligence, like this bathroom door. What the hell is this all about? Instead of a regular knob, we have this circular latch. How does this work? Method number one, shut the doors and turn the latch. 
Nope. Method number two. Turn the latch first, then shut the doors. Mm. Come on! Mm. Fuck! The bathroom is the worst possible place to have this problem. This door needs to shut. Nobody wants to see you in there doing your business. How did they fuck up something as simple as a door? Finally, here's an example of a hotel room with a real bathroom door. Isn't that nice? Now, where's the light switch? Where is it? You gotta be kidding me. It's outside the bathroom. Who came up with that idea? Put the light switch in the bathroom. Sure, some of the space is taken up by the tub, sink, and toilet, but you have plenty of wall space. Don't design a bathroom without a light switch. What if you're in the shower and your roommate accidentally flicks the wrong switch? They wouldn't even realize it would go pitch black in there. You'd be shouting over the sound of running water with soap and shampoo in your eyes. While we're on the topic of hotels, why are the stairs so elusive? Everybody's so used to elevators that the stairs are completely forgotten. If you ask the hotel staff, where's the stairs, they usually look at you funny, like you just asked where's the fucking shit bath. And when you do find the stairs, it looks like nobody's used them in years. I always feel like I managed to unlock some secret dungeon. Why are the stairs so taboo? Nobody knows where they are. What would everybody do if there was a fire? Hotels are the most bizarre, unpredictable examples of modern architecture. Not to mention, they're bullshit. No what's bullshit! If you stay in a lot of hotels, you come across some weird things, contraptions that defy human intelligence, like this bathroom door. What the hell is this all about? Instead of a regular knob, we have this circular latch. How does this work? Method number one, shut the doors and turn the latch. Nope. Method number two, turn the latch first, then shut the doors. Mm. Come on! Fuck! The bathroom is the worst possible place to have this problem. This door needs to shut. Nobody wants to see you in there doing your business. How did they fuck up something as simple as a door? Finally, here's an example of a hotel room with a real bathroom door. Isn't that nice? Now, where's the light switch? Where is it? You gotta be kidding me. It's outside the bathroom. Who came up with that idea? Put the light switch in the bathroom. Sure, some of the space is taken up by the tub, sink, and toilet, but you have plenty of wall space. Don't design a bathroom without a light switch. What if you're in the shower and your roommate accidentally flicks the wrong switch? They wouldn't even realize it would go pitch black in there. You'd be shouting over the sound of running water with soap and shampoo in your eyes. While we're on the topic of hotels, why are the stairs so elusive? Everybody's so used to elevators that the stairs are completely forgotten. If you ask the hotel staff, where's the stairs, they usually look at you funny, like you just asked where's the fucking shit bath. And when you do find the stairs, it looks like nobody's used them in years. I always feel like I managed to unlock some secret dungeon. Why are the stairs so taboo? Nobody knows where they are. What would everybody do if there was a fire? Hotels are the most bizarre, unpredictable examples of modern architecture. Not to mention, they're bullshit. No what's bullshit! Word pronunciations. The internet has joined the world together, and now everybody with all their different dialects and preferences gets to criticize each other for how they speak. 
A word that I cannot avoid using is review. I've always said review till everybody tells me it's review. Why would it be review? What about recap? Would you say recap? Redo? Recall? Rehire? Regroup? Reappear? Reenact? Why is it so strange to say review? The prefix re means to do again. You're viewing something again for comment. You review it. Bury. That's the next one. What am I doing wrong this time? It's bury. But everyone else says bury. It's spelled with a U, why wouldn't it be Burry? There is such a thing as Barry, but that's a different word and it's clearly spelled with an E, not to mention an extra R which doesn't seem to affect anything. This is Burry, that's Barry. If we have two different words that mean two different things and spelled two different ways, why the fuck don't we pronounce them two different ways? Why would anyone care anyway if I say review or bury? Are you confused? As long as you understand what I'm saying, what's the point of bringing so much attention to it? It's not important. However, if I took a word like walk and pronounced it like disanthoplanopius, then you might need to raise some questions. It doesn't matter because there's no consistency with pronunciations anyway. Oh, sorry, I should have said pronunciation. Well, then why do you pronounce a word? Why don't you pronounce it? I hate plural words, there's no rules. If the plural of pan is pans, then why the hell is there no such thing as mans? The plural of man is men. How about ox and oxen? Where'd they get that from? Why isn't it oxes? Like boxes! What's the plural of cock then? Coxen? How about moose? What would you say if there's more than one moose? Mooses, right? No, it's just moose. Yeah, it's the same fucking word. How about goose? Would you say, there's a flock of goose? No. You say geese. That's just great. Well then, fuck you. Next time I see a bunch of moose, I'm gonna say, hey, look at all those motherfucking meese. Don't tell me it's not a real word. It is. It is a word. I just said it. It should be on a goddamn shirt. What's up with mouse and mice? That makes no sense. Instead of house and houses, let's start saying house and heist. Booth, booths, tooth, tooths, sorry, teeth. Fuck plurals. Fuck silent letters, too. How about the middle day of the week? It's spelled like wedness day, but you pronounce it Wednesday. What's with the silent letters? Silent B, silent C, silent D, silent G, silent H, silent I, silent K, silent N, silent P, silent T, silent U, silent W. How about a silent... How about we'll pronounce our words however we want? Everybody's different. Talk the way you talk. Anybody who objects, shut the hell up. Suck our cocks in. I've spent my whole life trying to learn the English language, and I'll never get it perfect. Because it's bullshit. <laughs>
Not to mention, even while taking a piss, you can't get away from sports. No what's bullshit! Water. Specifically, the water that you drink. You need it to stay hydrated. When you're in public, you always end up having to buy bottled water, but there's so many different choices. It's just water. What's the deal? Have you ever read the back of the label? It should just say, ingredients, water. But it isn't always just water, is it? Dasani water, which is made by the Coca-Cola company, contains additives. Magnesium sulfate, potassium chloride, salt, adds a negligible amount of sodium? Negligible or not, I don't want sodium added to my water. The whole point is to hydrate yourself, not get more thirsty. And I'm not a chemist, but I don't know what all that other stuff is for. Oh, there you go. Minerals added for taste. Ah, I gotta love the taste of that magnesium sulfate and potassium chloride. And what's with the Dasani Drops flavor enhancer? On the ad on the website, it looks like period blood. At least you have plenty of different options whenever you're in a store. Here, you can make sure what you're buying is just plain water without any bullshit added to it. But in most public places, I've been taking notice, the only option is Dasani water. Seriously, go to a movie theater, anywhere, find water that isn't Dasani. It's not often. Dasani is everywhere, especially conventions and concerts, crowded, sweaty places where dehydration can be a serious problem. Why can't we have access to real water? I mean, come on, no other water besides Dasani? Coca-Cola bought out all these places and runs a monopoly on this basic human necessity. If they could find a way to buy the air we breathe and add chemicals to it, I bet they would. And that's bullshit. <laughs> No what's bullshit Sleep. I hate it. I could get so much more done if I didn't have to shut my eyes and go unconscious every now and then. Everybody has a different sleeping schedule. There's the early birds who represent the majority of our society, who function naturally during the day, and there's the night owls who function naturally during the night. We need both these kind of people to make the world work. But the part that triggers my bullshit alert is that the early birds often feel the need to look down upon night owls. Oh, you wake up at noon! As if they're superior just because they like to wake up at the ass crack of dawn. What is this stigma against night owls? Even Ben Franklin said, early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. What an ass. It's as if when the early birds see somebody asleep, they interpret it as laziness, without realizing night owls are working while they're asleep. Once the phone stops ringing and things become quiet, night owls can focus on being productive and get a lot done, especially artists who have to be creative. You can't always summon spontaneous imagination. Sometimes it only comes natural in the late night hours. If you're not a morning person, chances are you found out during school, when you're forced to wake up early no matter who you are. School starts so fucking early, all those years of my alarm clock waking me out of a deep REM sleep, I never got used to it. When you grow up, only then do you get to choose your own destiny. In college, everybody stays up late. I didn't know anybody in college who liked getting up early. Is it a generational thing? Maybe, and that's possibly the reason older generations like to make fun of night owls, because the elderly are never thought of as being energetic or lively, so when they see young people sleeping, that's their chance to get back at them. I've tried to get to the core meaning of why early birds make fun of night owls, and I think it has something to do with the awareness that somebody else is sleeping. The shut eyes and lack of consciousness has some connection with the appearance of death, and that makes people feel awkward, so they balance it out by making fun of the situation. That's why people sometimes play pranks on their sleeping friends, drawing on their faces, the old shaving cream in the hands, stuff like that. So I guess it boils down to the fear of death, the eternal sleep. But for now, we'll die in short intervals. We can't escape sleep. It's the inevitable bullshit. You know what's bullshit? 
Sometimes I talk about things that aren't that important, but this time it's about life and death. So I'm in my truck. I'm driving up to a red light. The light changes green. I keep going. But the next car comes through the intersection and nearly hits me. At first I think it's just some asshole running a red light, but then I notice all the cars are going through the light and then I realize it's a funeral procession. My frustration subsides and I feel a wave of sympathy. Funerals are not bullshit. They're a healthy way of getting together with family and mourning the death of a loved one. The part that's bullshit is that they don't make it clear enough that it's a funeral procession. It's not like anybody's directing traffic, or it's not like an ambulance or a police car that has loud sirens and flashing lights. These are just ordinary cars. Sometimes they have flags on top or just stickers on the windshield which you'll never see until you're up close. Other times they just have their blinkers on and that's it. When you see a car with their blinkers on from the side, it just looks like they have their turn signal on. You won't realize what's happening until the last second before impact. And the worst part is, everybody looks at you like you're the asshole, like you were trying to cut in on purpose. I respect that it's a funeral, but it'd be nice to keep there from being another funeral. Is it so necessary to stay together that it's worth disrupting the normal flow of traffic and endangering everybody on the road? Can't they just say, meet at the church, meet at the cemetery? Maybe in the old days people had a harder time finding their way, but now there's cell phones, there's internet, and there's GPS, which I admit GPS can be bullshit too. Let's respect the dead, but let's also respect the safety of people who are still alive. Dangerous funeral processions are bullshit. <laughs> No what's bullshit. Sometimes I talk about things that aren't that important, but this time it's about life and death. So I'm in my truck. I'm driving up to a red light. The light changes green. I keep going. But the next car comes through the intersection and nearly hits me. At first I think it's just some asshole running a red light, but then I notice all the cars are going through the light and then I realize it's a funeral procession. My frustration subsides and I feel a wave of sympathy. Funerals are not bullshit. They're a healthy way of getting together with family and mourning the death of a loved one. The part that's bullshit is that they don't make it clear enough that it's a funeral procession. It's not like anybody's directing traffic, or it's not like an ambulance or a police car that has loud sirens and flashing lights. These are just ordinary cars. Sometimes they have flags on top or just stickers on the windshield which you'll never see until you're up close. Other times they just have their blinkers on and that's it. When you see a car with their blinkers on from the side, it just looks like they have their turn signal on. You won't realize what's happening until the last second before impact. And the worst part is, everybody looks at you like you're the asshole, like you were trying to cut in on purpose. I respect that it's a funeral, but it'd be nice to keep there from being another funeral. Is it so necessary to stay together that it's worth disrupting the normal flow of traffic and endangering everybody on the road? Can't they just say, meet at the church, meet at the cemetery? Maybe in the old days people had a harder time finding their way, but now there's cell phones, there's internet, and there's GPS, which I admit GPS can be bullshit too. Let's respect the dead, but let's also respect the safety of people who are still alive. Dangerous funeral processions are bullshit. <laughs> You know what's bullshit? Look, just look. I don't need to say anything. Why does something this small need to have packaging this large? It's such a waste of cardboard, and it leads to more waste because oversized packaging requires oversized boxes to mail it in. I ordered this from Amazon, and when the box came, I didn't even know what it was. I thought I got drunk and ordered a big coffee table book or something. Then I opened it and saw this. You want to get technical? The jump drive is two and a half inches long. The packaging is 13 inches by nine inches. And if you were to use all that extra space, I estimate you could fit 45 jump drives. Now this right here is how it should be. This is proof 
that it can be done. This is the same company, Lexar, and I ordered both of them from Amazon. If they're from the same manufacturer and sold by the same place, why did they come in two completely different kinds of packaging? They're the same product too. The only difference is the capacity. One holds 128 gigabytes, the other holds 256. You might say the large packaging is for extra security or some shit, like if somebody robs an Amazon warehouse. Then wouldn't you think the more expensive jump drive would be the one in the large packaging? There's no way to make sense of it. Holding the big one is a surreal experience. It makes me feel like my hands are small, like I'm shrinking in size. Maybe this wasn't meant to be sold. Maybe it's a prop for the next Honey, I Shrunk movie. Also, this is a pretty serious piece of cardboard. You could break a window with this thing. To get the jump drive out with your bare hands, it would take a lot of force. Mm. Why do they make you have to use scissors? Holy shit, it even withstands scissors. You will not defeat me, you piece of shit! Jeez, it's been a while since I've talked about all this kind of nonsense. It's really hard because there's lack of time, but there's no lack of bullshit. those T-shaped things in clothing. I don't know if there's a name for them, and I don't give a shit, but all I know is they suck. You know what I mean, right? They're basically plastic strings that run through the fabric to attach the price tag. So after you buy them, you have to take them off. Could they come up with a better solution? How about just a sticker or something that clips on? I hate removing these things. I avoid buying new clothes just so I don't have to deal with this. <clears throat> Fuck! Once the tag is off, all hope is lost. I don't feel like having to find scissors every time I buy new clothes. I know there's probably an easier way to remove them, but why should we ever have to discuss how to remove tags from clothing? I don't care, it shouldn't even have to occupy the smallest portion of our brains. Removing them isn't even the part that's bullshit. The real bullshit is that you'll find these things laying all over the house. I don't understand why, because after I take them off, I throw them in the trash, but somehow they keep appearing everywhere. It's truly a phenomenon. If you have cats or infants, the stakes are raised because you don't want anybody swallowing them, so it becomes almost a matter of life or death to find these fuckers. They blend into the carpet. They turn invisible the moment you cut them off. When you use scissors, it makes two pieces, so you have to keep track of both of them. I always hold the end with the tag, but I don't have three hands, so the other end is going to fall somewhere. But I always find it and throw it in the trash immediately. Then how do they keep showing up? Where are they coming from? Are there little sneaky elves that come in and hide them around the house? It's a mystery, but the only thing that's perfectly clear is that they're bullshit. Shit! Wobbly tables. You know what I mean. You're at a restaurant or wherever. You lean on the table and whoa, it jiggles. Try cutting some steak and everything trembles like there's a fucking earthquake. Yeah, you sit across from somebody, you each place your elbows on the table, and it teeters back and forth like a seesaw. Is this supposed to be fun? Who likes this? I don't. I don't want to spill wine or coffee, stain my clothes, or burn myself. What causes this wobbly table phenomenon? Why is it so common? One example is the cross-shaped base. This is when the table is supported by only one leg but with four foot extensions. For some reason they aren't properly balanced or the floor is uneven or whatever, so one foot is always raised and the constant shifting of human weight causes the table to rock in four possible directions. It's similar to a D-pad on an NES controller. But this is no game. Maybe if you hooked up to an NES you can have the Mario Table D-pad challenge. There you go. Use that idea for your retro restaurant. 
you're welcome. Tables with four legs have the same problem, again likely due to the uneven floor, but sometimes one leg is ever so slightly shorter or missing a small piece on the bottom. How does this happen? Are there a group of magic gnomes sneaking about with saws and chisels? Let's ruin everybody's tables, hee hee hee. The problem persists with almost every type of table I've seen. The cross-legged base, trestle base, pedestal base, tennis ball foot, claw foot, big bird foot, cat in the hat, bazooka, palm tree foot, you know. How hard is it to make a table that isn't defeated by the natural predicament of an uneven earth? It's not a new invention. Tables have been around for a long time. The ancient Chinese ones were awesome. I bet those didn't wobble. How about the ancient Egyptian ones? I mean, look at that. Okay, that doesn't look too stable. But it's old! We need to find a better solution for tables. Drive a fucking metal stake through it. I don't care. Just get it to stop wobbling. I'm the bullshit man, and I missed you. But I wouldn't miss this bullshit! You know what's bullshit? Snow. Yeah, everybody knows it. What more could be said? But the topic is bullshit, and this is one of the bullshittiest of all. The only month I find snow welcome is in December, only if it comes down in moderation. You want that unreasonable balance where it's just enough to give you that holiday spirit, but not enough to affect your family travels. It's like asking for a slight hint of apocalypse. And the chance of it actually snowing on Christmas or whenever exactly it is you want it to happen is less than 10%. Unless you live inside of a movie, then it's 100 you want to see just enough snow to bring back all those childhood memories of school being canceled, having snowball fights, sledding, making snowmen. But now it's all about shoveling driveways, rescheduling appointments, and in the worst scenarios, trying not to get killed. When January comes, you're thinking, okay, snow, we get it. You made your point. Fuck you, too. Then February, it's so bad, it's not even worth complaining about. You're thinking, this is the worst of it. Just hang in there. It'll be over soon. And then March comes, and it's like, oh, come on! Enough already! St. Patrick's Day is supposed to be a green holiday, but it's always blanketed in white snow. When I was a kid, I remember playing outside, looking for four-leaf clovers. But recently, I don't think I've ever even seen a living clover on St. Patrick's Day. You'd have a better chance seeing a leprechaun. So maybe by Easter, it might be over? And then half the summer is spent trying to catch up on all the things you were trying to do that got postponed. And the summer heat is the only thing that rivals the snow. But as much as I hate wiping sweat from my forehead every 10 seconds to keep it from dripping into my eyes and swatting flies that keep landing in my ears, still, no matter how bad the summer gets, you can at least get in your car and drive to a grocery store. But in snow like this, you can't leave the house. Shut down your life, make no plans, just hibernate till it's all over. And next year, get ready to deal with it again and again and again. You might ask, if you hate snow so much, why do you choose to live in an area that gets snow? To that, I answer, I don't know. I don't know. All I know is, it's bullshit! <laughs> What's bullshit? There hasn't been any You Know It's Bullshit episodes in a long time, but that's only because of an already packed video schedule of all these different Cinemasker shows. So I had a meeting, sat down and talked with the Screenwave people, we worked out a new plan, a new schedule to get You Know It's Bullshit episodes released bi-monthly. That's right, bi-monthly. But as the meeting went on, there was some confusion. Half the room thought bi-monthly meant every two months, the other half thought it meant twice a month. So we looked it up. According to merriamwebster.com, bi-monthly has two definitions, occurring every two months or occurring twice a month. What the fuck? To confirm, we looked at oxforddictionaries.com, which says occurring or produced twice a month or every two months. In other words, it means whatever you want it to mean. Bi-monthly is a completely useless word. To say it, you'd have to assume the person you're talking to knows which of the two conflicting meanings you intend, and the same problem happens with the word bi-weekly. 
How did such a blunder fall into common English language? Which already has tons of problems. See my episode on word pronunciations. So obviously, the word buy means two. A bicycle has two wheels. Not one wheel for every two bikes. It means two. Simple as that. Similar to bi-monthly is bi-annually, but bi-annual simply means twice a year. So when we're talking in the measurement of weeks and months, we have conflicting ideas. But when we get to a year, we suddenly agree. There even exists a different word that means every two years. A completely separate word to offer distinction from biannual. The word is biennial. You gotta be kidding me. What's worse, a word that means two separate things or two separate words that sound alike? How could it be any more confusing? Then there's the word bicentennial, which is used when talking about a 200 year anniversary. In other words, two centuries. It never means twice in one century. Does this prefix have any consistency? Well, I gotta take a shit, which I do by daily, meaning twice a day or every other day, unlike by circadian, which only means twice a day, or by deli, which is twice every other day, or by duty, which means two shits in one sitting, or by fuck it day, which means I don't know what the fuck I mean, or by fucking bull, by fuck shit, which means the bullshit is coming back twice every something. So at least you're getting more, and that part ain't bullshit. You know what's BS? Having a wallet packed to the brim like George Costanza. But like any other problem from the 90s, it was solved with sleek slabs of futuristic alloys bound by synthetic fibers. It's Ridge Wallets! Ridge Wallets! Pack up to 12 cards into a variety of wallet styles and colors, like this black carbon fiber. I really love it, and apparently, so do 30,000 others. It even has a lifetime warranty and a 45-day test drive. They have other products too, like this shockproof card case for those who routinely drop their $1,000 piece of glass. Head on over to ridge.com slash cinemassacre and use code CINEMASSACRE for 10% off your order. You know what's BS? I can't say that word in the beginning of the videos anymore. But you know what's also BS? Apple's vendetta against buttons. You know what I mean. Apple's trying to phase out a basic and perfectly functional part of modern technology. The button. You push it. It makes things happen. But apparently, that's not good enough. Remember long ago when the mouse used to have two buttons? Even a trackball for vertical and horizontal scrolling? But then, Apple made them all vanish. I hope they're proud of themselves. Even the iPhone has only one button, which is perfectly fine since anything you want to press is on the screen. But try the Safari browser, for example. Bring up a web page, all the buttons are on the bottom, such as back, forward, etc. Perfect, right? But as soon as you start scrolling through a web page, the buttons disappear. Thanks. And it's not just Apple. Mostly anything you do on a modern device is done by complex touch commands. Touch the left, touch the right, drag two fingers, swipe three fingers. How about my middle finger? What's the deal with hiding buttons? Do they think it looks cleaner, like buttons are tacky? Do they think it makes it cutting edge and futuristic, like somebody at Apple saw it in a sci-fi movie and actually thought it would be a good idea in real life? What's next? Are they going to take away all the buttons on a keyboard? So all you have is a blank chrome slab of nothing? Oh, no, don't give him any ideas. I will never understand why minimalism is so appealing on a mechanical device, especially at the expense of function. Does anyone think this is cool? Like, oh yeah, look how tiny, smooth, and attractive my device is. It does more with less. It helps harness my mellow. It sparks joy, man. Isn't that impressive and cool? Well, forgive my cranky aging ass, but I'm a stuff-loving, button-mashing man. I like my damn buttons! You wanna camp out in line for the latest and greatest Super Device version 3 million point eight and a half or whatever, just because it's half a millimeter thinner and has no buttons? Are doorknobs gonna be next? Imagine a door with no knob. You have to swipe your finger on the spot where you think the doorknob would be. Well, I say to Apple and all these high-tech companies, I hope you're proud of yourselves. You made the buttons disappear. Great magic trick. Now, can you make them reappear? Cause that's bullshit. You know what's BS? Tape. Specifically, a roll of tape. The point of tape is that it's sticky. That physical property ironically causes such anguish. Despite engineered attempts to thwart this reality, 
tape will inevitably stick to itself. It will find its way loose from the plastic holder and become stuck in a perpetual loop, foiled by its primary function, to stick and be sticky without sticking so sticky. The problem happens most often with packing tape, the transparent or brown kind that you can use a dispenser with. The dispenser represents humanity's vain efforts to keep the tape from sticking to itself. But whenever you manage to cut off a piece of tape without the loose end slipping off the dispenser and becoming forever stuck to the roll, consider yourself lucky. Once it's stuck there, the first problem is finding it. You hold it in the light and turn the roll around and around until finally you see that little crease. You pick at it with your fingernails, but only manage to tear off a thin strip. You keep pulling, hoping this strip will go around the roll and be reunited with the main part of the tape, but instead it only creates its own perpetual loop, creating a secondary smaller roll of tape before ripping off and losing itself completely, and now you have to start all over again Again, but with the added mess of multiple tape rolls. Which is the real one? Where do you start? You're just fucked. You're wrapping a gift. It starts out innocently enough. You're busy folding that wrapping paper, trying to do a neat job at it, but now you need that tape. So you're leaning your elbow on the seam of those precious paper folds while picking at an endless circle of tape, praying for a miracle. You know there has to be an end. The tape is not infinite. But next thing, you're having a spiritual crisis. You start damning the person the gift is for. Surely it is their fault you cannot find the end of the tape roll. If you had a time machine, you could go back and warn your younger self not to engage with this person just so you don't have to buy them a birthday gift requiring gift wrap and deal with that torture invention tape. With cramped elbows and fingers bleeding, salted by tears of frustration and despair, you consider defeat. But just then, the bumpy ridges of a seam, angels descend and harps begin to play. Eureka! You grab the end between your forefinger and thumb, and with the grace of the Almighty begin to peel it back. Salvation is in sight, but it veers to the edge and rips, turning into that useless, unholy sliver. With that sliver now stuck to your finger, you cry out, Why? Why have you forsaken me? You continue to pick at the end of the tape, a roller coaster of hope and disappointment, growing old and senile with repetition until you're dead. Dead from tape. And furthermore, dead from bullshit. What's BS? The game Pogs, the most overly popular thing in existence. Mm. Wait a minute, it's not that popular anymore? Mm. Nobody even talks about it now? Mm. Forgotten? Mm. Completely? Mm. Huh, well. This type of bullshit seems to have been isolated in the 90s. I guess this episode should be retitled, You Know What Was Bullshit. So if you're younger than me and you're wondering what the hell are Pogs, let me explain. Pogs had its origin in Hawaii in the 20s with milk bottle caps that were turned into a game. Then the 90s, for some unknown reason, it got a huge revival as Pogs, named after the Pog juice brand. Rather than bottle caps, they were being mass produced as little cardboard discs, sort of like miniature drink coasters. They came in all different themes, and there existed every type of Pog imaginable. Ninja Turtle Pogs, Power Ranger Pogs, there even existed OJ Simpson trial Pogs. I'm not fucking kidding. They became a collector's thing, similar to trading cards, so kids would meet up and play a game with them, in which you'd have the opportunity to win more pogs for your collection or lose them to your friends or enemies. So basically, you'd bet your pogs, similar to chips and poker or other gambling games. You'd each put your pogs in a stack. Then using a thicker, heavier pog called the slammer, you'd take turns slamming it down on the stack, making them scatter. Then you'd get to take home every pog that landed face up or face down, I forget which. And it got serious. You were playing for keeps. When those pogs flipped, there was like a moral fuck and code. Even though you weren't betting actual money, it was still considered controversial on the school playgrounds. Kids liked to think they were badass by playing Pogs. They'd collect ones that had skulls and shit on them. But it got really out of hand. Every day after school, everybody I knew was playing Pogs. Looking back, it's hard to imagine how something could have been so popular when they're virtually non-existent today. But I tell you, they were like Magic the Gathering. They were a big fucking deal. To understand the gravity of what I'm saying 
happening here. This was like the 90s equivalent of Pokemon Go. Hard to believe, but it really was that big. Back then, I was sick of hearing about them, and now I'm just as perplexed how easily certain bullshit like this could just vanish overnight. These things were just as common as free AOL discs. You couldn't look anywhere without seeing them laying around. They spread across the earth. Now they've been gone for like 20 years. Good riddance, but geez, that's the pure definition of the word fad. Where did they all go? I mean, physically, where did they put them all? The mathematics don't make sense. There were so many, but now the only way to find them is if you're actually looking on purpose. And who knows, maybe they'll come back. Oh no, did I just contribute in any way to help encourage Pogs to make a comeback? I hope not, that would be bullshit. What's BS? Stickers on fruit. Do you like to eat stickers? No? Well, then why put them on fruit? They're on all produce. Try cutting an apple or something, then you take a bite. Oh sh there's a sticker in my mouth. Oh, you can just take them off? Bullshit. Oops, I fucked up my tomato trying to peel the sticker off. If you try using a knife, you'll end up losing a big chunk of the fruit or veggie, and hopefully not a big chunk out of your finger. Watch out, this is extra work. Why does there always have to be stickers on it? Now, of course, I know what the stickers are for. They are PLU, price lookup codes, and they apparently come from the International Federation for Produce Standards. Bananas are code 4011, broccoli are 4060, eggplants are 4081, and so on. It tells the register which fruit or veggie it is. Makes more sense than barcoding everything, I guess. Speaking of barcodes, a lot of stores have scales in the produce department that let you weigh and ring up your own produce before you get to the register, but it prints out an even bigger sticker. Sure, it skips a few steps at checkout, like the employee punching in the item and weighing it, but that's their job, not mine. I actually did a test. I removed all the stickers from my produce, and the cashier was able to ring them up just fine. No extra weight. But then again, everything I bought was pretty normal. I think the issue is, there exists too much produce. Look at this, there's like 20 different apples, all this tropical shit, horned melons. Wow, that's frightening. There's 1,500 PLU codes currently. That's a lot of produce. Couldn't we pare it down to like 50, you know? Keep it simple? Also, what's the deal with advertising on produce? I get that cereal boxes and snacks do it because those boxes stick around for weeks, maybe months, but most produce wrappers are immediately thrown away. How is that effective advertising? I'm not gonna buy lettuce just because there's a Jedi on it. That's why I think pineapples are the perfect fruit because they can't be defaced with a sticker. They have a a naturally spiky defense system. They had to tie some stupid rope to the stalk to avoid the death spikes. Yeah, pineapples are metal as fuck, and that ain't bullshit. You know what's BS? Inflatable decorations. These lawn parasites have taken over suburbia the last 20 years. You can't go 40 feet down a sidewalk without bumping into one of these baffling blow-up dolls. A lot of people refer to autumn as the fall. Yeah, the fall of decorating decency. Great job, society. Our neighborhoods went from a spine-tingly, spooky sideshow of vintage Halloween classics to an air-filled obstacle course of licensed characters and cliche family-friendly frights. Which really sucks, because we are truly living in the renaissance of Halloween decorating. There's even entire stores nowadays dedicated to Halloween that pop up each year. They usually take residence in an abandoned strip mall or former retail store during the season. It's almost like the original store died, and now it's a ghost. Anyway, one stroll through and you'll realize how many awesome decorations there are available. Hmm, here's the inflatable costumes. Rightfully next to the poop costumes. But where are all the inflatable decorations? Why aren't they on display next to the cool mechanical monsters? Because the inflatable crap isn't cool, that's why. They hide them in the back. The employees must be ashamed of them. And there's only like six different models to choose from in this lawn scares section. Hmm, then where is everyone buying all these lousy lawn ornaments? At your local home improvement store, that's where. 
Yep, the same place that sells bubble wrap and toilets also carries these giant monstrosities. Home improvement, my ass. Actually, wow, there's a lot of really cool classic decorations here, too. Look at this giant skeleton, these animatronics, and all this other spooky shit. All the good stuff is here, but it's looked down upon by the inflatable stuff, literally. They loom above like spirits in a bog. Except for this minion. I guess it died up there. Ugh, I don't think the minions are six feet tall. People find them cute because they're short. Not tall as a grown-ass person. And this one's a pirate with a sword. Good riddance. Ha, <laughs> yeah, outdoor pest is right. Man, I don't mean to change my mind mid-episode, but the giant Oogie Boogie, Beetlejuice Sandworm, and Audrey from Little Shop of Horrors are kind of cool. That's my main problem. I hate that I actually like a lot of these. They just don't match any of my older decorations. They glow like a beacon and look too cartoony. The only thing they match is each other. They are the Funko Pops of decorating. And it's not just Halloween. These things are really out in full force during Christmas. You may have seen my You Know It's Bullshit on the Christmas Aftermath, where I talk about people leaving their decorations out past their season. Well, coupled with Halloween, every other house looks like a tacky closing mattress store from late August until fucking February. I've even seen some lawns that had a mix of Halloween and Christmas balloons at the same time. It's like some Jekyll and Hyde transfiguration that got stuck midway through. Actually, these displays might be the scariest I've ever seen. Toss Thanksgiving into the mix, too, and imagine the nativity scene, but the three wise men are Jack Skeleton, a turkey pilgrim, and a Dallas fucking cowboy. Okay, okay, I'm not just talking shit. I speak from experience. I've gotten a few of these things before, and it always ends in disaster. Their usual position is face down in your lawn, making Santa look like a damn drunk. They can't handle the seasonal rain or the wind too well, and you always have to constantly restake them down because they shift every day. Not because they're balloons or whatever, as they're not filled with helium. They inflate with an air pump that provides a constant supply of regular air. You cut power to the pump, and they die quickly. People usually set them on a timer, so they only run at night with the regular string lights. But then, they look all deflated in the daytime, like piles of balloon baloney. So if these things aren't blown up 24 hours a day, your lawn looks like a Who Framed Roger Rabbit massacre took place. Or, I guess the villain in Frosty the Snowman won, and Frosty melted to the ground. I always wanted to know what Frosty looked like flaccid. Save money by just scattering rainbow-colored garbage bags all over your lawn if you want the same same shitty effect. All right, so the overriding issue is that these things are supposed to make decorating easier. In theory, you stake it down, plug the shit in, and it blows up. Done. Great. Finished. But what do we gain for this convenience? It's kind of like in Christmas Vacation. The struggles of dealing with the decorations made them all the more impressive when they finally worked. Sure, no one wants to deal with the Clark Griswold headache of tangled cables and broken bulbs, but the inflatables still have problems. They get holes, they fall over easy, the pump breaks, the stakes get lost, and they're also noisy as hell because of the constant airflow. I think the entire situation can be summed up by looking at no mess carvable pumpkins. While at the store, I noticed these things, and in fact, I've used them in many of my videos. They're made of a soft vinyl or some shitty space age material that lets you carve a pumpkin without carving an actual pumpkin. Gone are the days of pumpkin picking, gutting, and carving. Now you carve once and it lasts for a thousand years or until the plastic degrades. I guess it's cool you can keep the same design from years to year, but where's the fun in that? What happened to the Halloween experience? I wish we could turn back to when Halloween actually meant something. Now, it's bullshit. I mean, boo shit. It's boo shit. Anyway, happy Halloween and Merry fucking Christmas. You know what's BS? group texts. It all starts with what should probably be some important or exciting news. Someone got engaged or has an awesome vacation photo or some other happy horse. Now, I am sympathetic to the ease of group texting everyone in one fell swoop, but the barrage of responses and the ding, ding, ding all day from people I don't even know quickly soils this joyful announcement and leaves me wanting to throw my phone out the window. It could happen to anybody. That random friend texts you they just had a baby, and next thing you realize, you're on a group text with like 20 
20 other people you don't even know. Next thing, congratulations, congratulations, congratulations. The maddening ding, ding, dings begin and you're, you're stuck getting everybody's texts all fucking day. And then you're Googling frantically to find what's the easiest way to opt out of it. They're like the Hunger Games. Your number is thrown in there against your will and you have no choice but to fight your way out. Brother against brother, mother against child, young against old. May the odds be in your favor. This shit happens on the socials all the time too, but at least there you can say bye and leave the conversation before your family starts talking about their hemorrhoids or whatever. Also, if you don't have an iPhone and you're in a group text with iPhone users, you don't stand a chance. You have no allies because you don't know who any of the new phone numbers are from. And if you ask everyone, you get a flood of names. Each is another blow to your sanity and will to live. There is no use fighting it. Just bury your phone in the mud and live off the grid for a few days until it blows over. It's the only way to survive. Group texts are bullshit. You know what's BS? Startup sounds. You know what I mean. You turn on your computer, your PlayStation, launch Netflix, or whatever, and you always get this loud welcome chime that ain't too welcome. I don't need some noise to let me know I just turned my system on. Gee, I would have never guessed. I had no idea that two seconds ago I pushed a button. What's the point? To let me know it's working? I'll find that out soon enough. Super Mario Galaxy! Whenever you start up a device, you better hope the volume isn't turned up too loud. Maybe last time you were watching a quiet movie or playing a quiet game so you had to turn the volume up loud to hear it, and next time you start it up, blam! Jet engine decibels shattering your eardrums. If it's late at night, congratulations, you just woke up the whole house. Now everybody has to know I just turned my computer on. Thanks. It's also real nice when you're in a classroom or a library. Thanks for directing the attention of the entire room on me. Real appreciated. I'm not saying it's impossible to avoid. There's many options. I could leave my computer on at all times, which I try to do. At least on Mac, I know you can mute the volume before you shut it off, but I'm not gonna remember that every single time. You can also download software that automatically mutes it whenever you shut down, or go into the terminal and enter a specific command. But these are all workaround solutions. Why couldn't Apple have a simple option in the preferences to disable the startup sound? That would have been too easy. If you like startup sounds, there's nothing to complain about. But if you don't like them, can't there be a simple user-friendly way to turn them off? In general, many different types of devices and appliances, no matter what they are, make way too many noises. Ever had a dryer with a buzzer? When it finishes drying your clothes, you hear Or a microwave. When the timer's up, it goes beep, beep, beep. I already made a whole episode about that. It makes me nervous. It puts me on edge. At any second, something in the house could beep. Ah, oh, something has a battery dying. Beep, beep, all night, everywhere. Beep, beep, enough of the beeping, enough of the noise. I'd rather hear the sloppy sounds of turds dumping out a bull's ass, because that's bullshit. You know what's BS? Mattress sheets. They never stay on the corners of the mattress. They pop out, and next thing, in the middle of the night, you're sleeping half on the sheets and half on the bare mattress. What causes this? All I did was sleep. There's not much else I'm able to do while sleeping, except somehow pull the sheet from underneath the edge of a mattress. How does that happen? How much do I move in my sleep in order to pull out a mattress sheet? And how come there's no better way to fasten them on? Couldn't there be a button? Some kind of latch? Tie them? No, just push them under the mattress. Gee, great. I've tried tucking them under really far, duct taping them, stapling them. I've even watched all the Martha Stewart and Snoop Dogg tutorials, but they're always going to come off. I really hate it when the sheet barely creeps on the corner and you know it's about to come off. It taunts you. You're laying there, sleepy as hell, 
the last thing you want to do is get up off the bed and adjust the sheet. You try to fix it while you're laying there, but the weight of your body is keeping it from moving in any direction except for off the mattress. So you try to get back to sleep and stay absolutely still, but that sheet just keeps inching higher up on the corner, closer, closer, and blam, there goes the fucking sheet. And anyway, why does a mattress sheet matter so much? I don't know. I guess it's just because it's a barrier between you and the uncleanable surface. It's the only thing that shields you. It's the very cocoon of protection while you're at your most exposed state of unconsciousness. I mean, you gotta have a mattress sheet, and yet it's a losing battle. Mattress sheets have been engineered to fail us in our time of sleepy vulnerability. I'm pretty sure it's a conspiracy orchestrated by aliens. As we turn off our brains and go into dreamland, we become prey to extraterrestrial predators. They plant alien spider eggs into our mattresses, only to be contained by mattress sheets. When the sheets come off, the spiders are released. They crawl into our ears to mute our eardrums so we can't hear the space drones entering our bedrooms to steal bits of our DNA and clone our identities. And maybe that's why everyone shows you all the wrong ways to put a sheet on a mattress. They're aliens, and it's all an elaborate ruse to frustrate us so immensely that we eventually cast off the sheets entirely, and thus we are wide open to nightly alien experiments. Now, I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. But the point is, mattress sheets are bullshit. Micro SD cards. Let me tell you, they aren't kidding. They're really micro. They're way too small. Smaller than a dime. Dangerously small. I bet a ton of these have been swallowed by infants or pets. It's almost like they made them this small on purpose, so you'll lose them and have to buy more. These minuscule memory motherfucks were originally made for cell phone storage, because I guess regular SD cards were too big. And speaking of phones, you seen Zoolander? Ben Stiller's character has this really tiny cell phone, which of course is a parody on how technology keeps making things smaller and smaller. Well, there's a real-world tactile limit to how small a phone can get, because a human still has to interact with it. Well, whoever came up with micro SD cards said, who cares, and created the most losable piece of technology possible. Sure, they usually come bundled with these plastic converter shells, but then you end up with 10 of these things laying around because they're useless after you lose all your micro SD cards. Look, it's the rest of them! But they're supposed to just hang out in your phone as storage, right? No biggie. They won't be handled that often, right? Nope. We have a bunch of devices that only use micro SDs for storage. Game capture devices, VR cameras, GoPros, etc. And guess what? If you need to buy a large capacity SD card, a lot of stores only carry them in the micro variety. And let's say you do buy one and don't lose it, the card has awful heat displacement, which means overheating is a huge problem, which gives you recording errors or forces your camera to turn off. And if that doesn't piss you off, try reading the tiny text on the card without a magnifying glass. You need to know this information, and it's written on this scrap of itsy-bitsy, razor-thin plastic like it's Cold War spy versus spy microscopic microfiche bullshit. Bullshit. Here's a solution. Let's go back to analog. I've just created the macro SD card. Just jam an old VHS tape into your phone. Yeah, good luck losing that shit. And that's bullshit. Bullshit.